But tonight's going to be nice. Much nicer than the weather. Now please welcome someone I've known for a long time in a totally different capacity, Steve Steinhaus from Chicago, Illinois. Or, or Lemington Spa, depending on if you keep the store at home. But uh, very good. I see. When did you guys come here? 15, 16 years ago? When I first moved here. Yeah. Uh, 19 years uh, yesterday. Wow. 19 years yesterday. And you came to study Shakespeare? Uh, yeah. And uh, I came to study Shakespeare, uh, I then uh, got married, had two now humongous children. Uh, so my two boys uh, were born in Warwick, Warwick Hospital. Um, and uh, I taught and played in a couple of different bands and then eventually joined the Dr. T. Fig Band who um, played all over the place for a number of years. Um, and I kept thinking, well, this is the year I'll move back to the States. <laughs> and it never happened. And then I met my, my now wife um, and had the startling revelation and realization that Chicago is, is my home, but it's not my home. And this is my home and this is where I'm, uh, I've made my life uh, in, uh, in and around Birmingham and the, and the West Midlands and Warwickshire. So, well, currently what you're doing is very interesting. There's a lot of uh, space between your birth and Chicago. Yes. Where did you born in Chicago? I was born. I was born in Oak Park, Illinois, which is literally on the border of Chicago. It's where Ernest Hemingway was born, um, and uh, my my parents were living in the city, but we were, I was born in the Oak Park General. I, I don't know what the hospital was called. So, um, when, when did you first notice the blues? Well, um, I uh, at the age of five, my mom. This is this is going to be good. You'll never you've never heard a story like this. My mom joined a religious cult, uh, born again Christian, faith healing, snake handling, uh, oil and wine, speaking in tongues, the whole thing, and anything that was secular, i.e., non-religious and i.e., non-Christian, uh, was was bad. Um, so my contact with music from the age of five to the age of ten was filtered through that church. Um, fortunately for me, uh, two things. One is that I lived in Chicago, so there was incredible gospel music going on. Um, and secondly, uh, my dad did not join the cult and steadfastly adhered to, well, drink drugs and, and rock and roll slash blues. So, uh, as a child, I saw the, the temptations and the tops and things like that, and, and um, I, I, he managed to convince my mom that the Chicago Blues Festival had enough gospel in it that it counted as as religious music as opposed to secular. Uh, so there I was, a little, well, in, incredibly large for their age, uh, little white kid. Thank you. Um, that, that's not a real pint in my hand. That is half a pint. You know, right? <laughs> Look, it's like Hagrid. Um, but uh, um, go to the pint, I'm afraid. But so uh, you know, at a very early age, six, seven, eight, I was at the Chicago Blues Festival for three days with my dad. Um, and you know, when it rolls into June, I still feel the physical pain of not being there because that was that was life. Um, and uh, so that was my my original contact was with you know uh, Big Daddy Kinsey and the Kinsey Report, you know Otis Rush, you name it, they were there because it, it is it, it is in my opinion, and it sure as hell was then. That was the festival, and um, it still just runs over. There's a little there's a pre thing on Thursdays, and it, it runs from there. Um, and so that was my contact with it. But it was still sort of forbidden, I guess. Um, and then when I was in middle school, I, I distinctly remember this. Um, there was a, I can't even remember the name of the band. They were a three-piece blues power trio from, uh, from Beverly, uh, African-American neighborhood south, south side of Chicago. And they, uh, they came to our white, working class sort of Italian 
Irish, Polish, Hispanic, a bunch of us, you know, with the mullets, and we had it all there. And they come up there, and they're, they're whipping out the standards, you know, got my mojo working, this, that, and the other thing. And then they had a question and answer session at the end, and I'm 14, and uh, I say, I raise my hand, I say to the bass player, I said, so what's your real job? And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, you obviously don't do this for a living. You couldn't, you couldn't survive doing this. We've never heard of you. How, you know, how can you make a way? And he says, he says, let me tell you something. At some, I, I would do the, the uh, impression, but that would be cruel. And he said, let, let me tell you something. At some point, you're going to figure out that we lose life. And when you figure that out, come find me. Um, and it took me a hell of a long time to figure that out. So I didn't come back to the blues once we left the church and everything. Um, I went headlong into, unfortunately, 80s music. So hair metal and, you know, uh, political hip hop, etc. And uh, thrash and, and things like that. And I didn't rediscover the blues as something that I could be involved with until I moved back here um, in probably 2000. Because uh, I, <coughs> it was part of me, but I didn't think it was part of me as a performer. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, did you did you actually sing when you were in Chicago? Uh, I sang in church choirs. Okay. And um, did, you, did you sing any relation to the blues while you were in Chicago? Well, uh, we, my contact was through singing gospel songs yeah. and things like that. Uh, I wouldn't say we sang hymns because it was an evangelical cult. So there were uh, a, a variety of styles and whatnot. Um, and it's difficult to, to place now because my voice is so much deeper. But I was a, a, a child soprano. So, you know, I, it was always nice. Yeah, so I, was I know. Um, did you wear shorts? Or? No, I did not wear shorts. Uh, but Absolutely. fortunately or unfortunately, uh, my voice changed when I was like 12. I was shaving when I was 12. <laughs> and it all just kind of went to hell. And that was, that was it. And so my contact with the music world uh, through my teens and whatnot was as a fan first. And I still say I'm a fan first. Um, and then through working security. You know, working, uh, working gigs at uh, the Hard Rock Cafe in Chicago, working he, gigs when I was at university. He was a dancer. I'm first meeting he introduced himself as a dancer who sings. Yes, yeah. And literally, the first time I got a gig was somebody was sound checking and I was messing around on the mic and somebody said, can you do that, like, with a band behind you? And I said, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and away we went. But there were many years in the, the, this being the home of heavy metal, there was many years in the, the heavy metal and punk and hardcore thrash wilderness um, until I rediscovered rhythm and blues by moving <laughs> to Warwickshire and hanging out in Birmingham. But how about that? You know, but uh, fantastic. Here's a strange question. Um, we were in Chicago to live at the structure, which is, of course, a suburb of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea, any sort of image about what sort of music Birmingham was producing? Uh, Birmingham's a home of Black Sabbath, it, you know. You knew the Sabbath? Oh, of course. That's all I knew about it. I knew the university was there, and the university had a very good reputation, and I knew that it was the birthplace of Black Sabbath. I didn't know about football. I didn't know about the Industrial Revolution. I didn't know about anything other than that. But that was enough, really, for me. Um, because, uh, well, and I knew the Midlands were sort of the home of, the, of British metal. Yeah. Um, both industrial and music. Uh, but that's about it. That's about all I know. The UK capital of rock and roll. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what entice you? When did you first start singing? I mean, I, I must tell this symbol of multitude. The first time I met you, you were an integral part of the lead singer with a tremendous band called the Dr. T Big Band. Does anyone recall that band? Mm -hmm. They got terrific. We have a little cafe next door to my office. And every time I go there for a cup of coffee, there's a one in two chance that they're playing their <laughs> album from all those years ago. Yeah. Dr. T. Well, tell, tell, tell me how that So, um, the original band leader, the guy who started Dr. T. Big Man, is a, a gentleman named Simon Camp. 
aka Simon the Duke of Kent. Uh, you might know from other incarnations, he had a band called the Night Trippers for a while, which was an homage to Dr. John. Uh, he's got a rhythm and blues sort of people's orchestra that he runs down, things like that. And he was a lighting designer at the Royal Shakespeare Company. So I met him at a party because my now ex-wife worked at the Royal Shakespeare Company and we kind of started talking about music and moved very quickly from Henry Rollins and third wave American punk into a proper discussion of blues. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. When I moved back in 2000, ran into him and he said, you know, I really want your opinion. I've got this band and I really want your opinion. We're playing at the Royal Shakespeare Company in the green room. Come and have a look. So I went to have a look and I said, uh, okay, um, you know, and I stayed, which for me is rare. Um, and afterwards he said, you know, give it to me honestly. And I met him like three, four times. And I'm from Chicago, so we are brutally, bluntly honest. Um, and I said, do you really want me to tell you? He said, yeah. I said, well, your lead singer is unbelievably talented, but I'm not sure he wants to be in this band. Uh, and your brass section needs to take solos and needs to be choreographed. And you all should be dressed the same, same suits, work on a few more original tunes. Here's a couple suggestions of songs you might want to play. That's it. And I didn't see him for about three months and then he called me up and said I need a debt for uh, a gig this August. And I said, yeah, what do you want me to do? Carry the equipment? <laughs> and he says, he says, no, I want you to sing. And I'm like, come on. He had seen me in a what was referred to as a UK hardcore, UK HC punk band from Coventry. Um, you know, spinning back kicks and, you know, beating the hell out of people in a mosh pit and smacking them with a the microphone and snot and whiskey and blood and everything. And he said, no, 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 trust me. You need to sing for us. And I was like, nah, I, I can't do this. And he's like, well, I'll come over and we'll have a look. So we had an old piano in the house and he comes over and he plays uh, the intro to Let the Good Times Roll, the, the Ray Charles version. And he goes, da -da -da -da. and I went, yeah, what? what? What do you want me to do? He says, come on, you know this. I'm like, no, I don't know. He says, look, I'll sing the first line. And he goes, da -da 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 -da. hey, everybody. And I went, all right. And he goes, da -da -da -da. hey, everybody. Like that. And he went, and he stopped, put the cover down over the keys, and he said, I lied to you. I don't need a debt. I need a front man. And that front man is you. This music is in your DNA. You grew up in Chicago. You just need to rediscover, rediscover it. I will help you. Let's go conquer the world. And we went from there and played, uh, you know, Europe and toured the States twice and, and uh, played the Olympics in one of our last gigs uh, on the Hyde Park stage on Golden Saturday and things like that. And I, don't, I still to this day don't know what he saw when I was beating the hell out of some skinhead in a mosh pit in Coventry, why he, he recognized there was a, a kindred spirit. Um, but it, it, it's, it's funny. I just never thought that I could sing that. And actually, it's the music that I am most suited to sing. So um, it was, you know, I owe Simon Kemp my, well, e pretty much everything that I do musically now is because of that click, that uh, moment, um, and a shared love of, of, that, of that music. Well, talking about the places you've toured through, many of those, um, do you have any record of my baby? I do. <laughs> Tell me what I do. About. Um, well, I like in Marbella, the first time we played Marbella, um, it was, I mean, I haven't been back, so it was under construction. They've been built since you. Oh, have they, yeah. Uh, so it was under construction, which felt a lot like Cancun in the 80s when Cancun was being literally built and I was there as a little kid when I was about four or five and they had two hotels and Cancun is now this you know holiday metropolis and there was a lot of EU money kicking into Marbella when we were there and um, so our first gig because I am a teacher that is my day job I, uh, I now run my own school but because of that our first gig was for 500 
Spanish school students. Now, unfortunately or fortunately for them, I speak Spanish. So I can't remember what I was trying to say, but what it was translated to was, every one of you come up here on stage with me. So all these kids, it's like 12, 12 in the afternoon. We've got three more gigs that day. Um, and I'm in a zoot suit. We got the band behind me, you know, seven piece, seven piece band. Um, and these kids are jumping up and down and, and singing along and playing. And it, it's one of those moments where, you know, the, despite the roots of blues being an impression, the blues-based uh, music forms that you find, so much are based on joy and a shared commonality. I remember um, when I was 18, uh, I had to attend a conference in New York for the future leaders of America which was just a right-wing front, let me just say. I think Trump was involved somehow, but we'll, uh, we'll leave that out. Um, and Dizzy Gillespie spoke. Um, and uh, there I was in wrestling boots. <laughs> um, I had something like a Metallica t-shirt on, a hat on backwards, really long hair, um, and I was transfixed. And he said, he was talking about working with a Russian ensemble, and um, they didn't use any written music. All they used was scat to communicate. So he'd go, bah, 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 and they go, bah, 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 and, and that's how they created an entire evening's performance. And that universi universality, uh, universality of blues-based music, um, you know, it, uh, I, I'm reminded of it constantly, 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 constantly. And the school that I work at now, as as principal, you will play songs that every single one of us in this room know, and they have never heard it, have no idea. But you play blues, and three, four songs in, some kid will go, oh yeah, and it's that that commonality um, that keeps me coming back to it as as a fan, as a, uh, a promoter, as a band booker, and, a, and as a musician, which is why people say, oh, it must be really hard because I'm the music director for the Upton Blues Festival. It's the biggest, one of the biggest free blues festivals in Europe, award-winning, all this stuff. Oh, it must be so difficult. No, it's not. It's like going shopping in the meat aisle for me. I'll have two of those, six of those. Here we go. It's, it's brilliant because um, if you can keep in your heart that original contact with the genre and contact with music as a fan or, or a, as a starting musician and that that the realization but also the joy of it um, then it keeps rolling and rolling and rolling I was going to come at this at the end of the conversation you boys here now um, C school is for correct me but I'm sure you're certainly going to be wrong. It's for at risk pupils. At risk pupils, yeah. And at risk of permanent exclusion. Could you just give us a couple of minutes of background of what that entails? Because I find it totally engrossing what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. When, we, when I first started working with Upton Blues, um, we started to create, you'll love this, we started to create an education program which we refer to as Bluesical Youth. Um, you know, <laughs> past the chord progression on the left hand side and all that and it kind of just it didn't necessarily uh, uh, knock down buildings with success because um, teachers are notoriously busy they're notoriously busy in the summer term and trying to get people involved was difficult but as it grew we started to narrow our focus onto um, what can only be described as and are described in, in general terms as disadvantaged students. So that would be students um, in receipt of free school meals. Um, and the, the term in uh, the national picture would be referred to, they were, received pupil premium funding, which means their childhood has been affected by poverty. Essentially, that's the easiest way to explain it. And from that work, I started, the, the, the blues outreach work then started to feed into the kids I wanted to work with in my professional career. Um, and as that happened, uh, this opportunity came up. And uh, I work in Solihull, uh, and Solihull is one of the more affluent 
regions of the West Midlands or the Midlands in general, but up until a couple of years ago, it permanently excluded, or for the Americans, expelled um, more students than 90% of the rest of the country. Now, if you're a religious person, that's a sin. If you are a moral person, that's a crime. And it's unforgivable. Um, so, and then if you add on the idea that in this country, one in every four students who is permanently excluded will die before the age of 25, it kind of hardens a moral resolve to say, Something needs to change. The game needs to change for these kids. We need to find something different. Um, and that is the that is the, the, the driving force behind the school that we've set up is to catch these kids before that slide becomes inertia and and uh, and unstoppable. Um, and uh, you know, uh, does that connect to? my life as a musician and a, and a fan and a presenter and a, and a vocalist? Probably, because actually, um, I think I've had this conversation with you before, Jim, is that back in the old days with Dr. T, I always used to say my goal was to be more Dr. T in my everyday life as opposed to just when I'm on stage. Because the doctor looks after everybody, takes care of everybody, makes sure everybody has a good time, is sexy despite his size, uh, can dance, can do whatever, um, and he, the doctor, has the cure for what ails you. Um, and it's only now running this school that on a daily basis I feel I got a little bit of the doctor <laughs> working, which is, uh, which is kind of a great way to, to uh, have the hardest job you've ever had in your life like surfing in an ocean of flame, but you also have that little bit of oxygen. And we as a team get that little bit of oxygen because we are trying to, we are fighting for the future on a daily basis. Um, and uh, you know, the way I interact and the way we interact with our students um, is totally, totally driven by my experience as a fan in those very early days where the person on stage made you feel like you were the only person in the world and that they were singing just to you. And in, when I was little, it was, this song goes out to that little blonde haired man and now this song goes out to that gigantic bald man or whatever it is, that inclusivity that rhythm and blues music has engendered in me is now what I've made my life's work, I guess. Looking right back now, we experience all these years, which of the original musicians, the older black musicians, mm -hmm. do you still listen to, do you still enjoy, do you recommend that you play to your kids, which ones stand out for you? Somehow. The start? Um, quite often, <laughs> somehow it's followed by somehow. <laughs> um, I mean, I do it like, I had a very interesting experience playing somebody Jimmy Witherspoon. Now that's, that's much later. But playing somebody Jimmy Witherspoon and then they finding that the sound, that sound, was felt far more archaic than the actual <coughs> earlier recordings. Um, and I guess you can see why. Um, Winoni Harris, obviously. Um, Howlin' Wolf on occasion, but everybody says, everybody says Howlin' Wolf. Of course. Um, but I, 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 we had this discussion before the camera was rolling. Um, I am of the generation that has to choose or mix the, the explosion of British blues with the uh, original artists that inspired that. So, you know, uh, I, I have the dubious honor of having seen Buddy Guy from Chicago, all the only time I've seen him was at Birmingham Town Hall, and having seen John Mayall at Buddy Guy's Legends in Chicago. So that that crisscross, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not a huge fan of Clapton anymore, probably more because of his politics, but let's not talk about that. But I saw the Big Town Playboys open for Eric Clapton, and that was my first engagement with the scene that Dr. Teeth eventually kind of became part of. Um, 
So that mixture of old and new, um, you know, somebody, obviously my, if you know anything about me when I was a teenager, my thing was Stevie Ray Vaughan. I mean, I saw his last, I saw his last ever concert. Um, but what I loved about Stevie Ray Vaughan is that he always made sure, you like what I'm doing? Then listen to these guys. Uh, and I really always admired that because there's there was nobody at that time playing and singing and writing at the level he was and yet he always paid it back um, regardless of what you think about Lonnie Mack Stevie Ray Vaughan played on that whole, whole album because it was somebody who, who gave him that start and, and you know um, making those connections back I mean obviously uh, Albert Collins I'm a big fan of um, Buddy Guy I'm a big fan of uh, I'm starting to listen now in my uh, in my gray period <laughs> um, to a lot more harmonica than I used to a lot more harmonica based stuff and um, uh, I, I, whenever we have uh, Paul Lamb or Honey Boy Hickling at Upton I just bore them to tears talking about Charlie Muscle White and things like that. So it's it's a hey and water. Oh of course, of course. Um, so it's a you know it's a mixed palette. And as we were saying earlier before the camera started rolling, in the digital age, I mean what a time to listen to the blues where you can hear everything. Um, and I spend a lot of time as a booker of blues based music. Um, listening to or getting emails or Facebook messages about that's not real blues. That's you know that's rock and roll or that's this that and the other thing. Um, so mark our cards. Who's emerging? Who's coming through? Who are who we next should now look out for? Because with your finger on the pulse of up to the all places, you must mm. know. Who the, who the good guys are. I mean, I, uh, this, despite my rather meat-headed appearance, um, my goal for Upton is by uh, 2020, but it'll probably be 2021 now, is that we're 50-50, because I'm very um, committed to um, gender balance in our booking policies. So uh, the, the most exciting acts coming through for me are female featured or, f or female fronting and think about particularly something like Ellis Bailey, um, uh, Katie Bradley. Uh, oh, you wouldn't say she's coming through. She's, she's, you know, she's already, they're both known commodities. Those are the exciting, um, well, because it gives me an opportunity to do what I said when I, when I took over booking the festival that we would do, is that we would have half and half female fronted or female featuring. Um, artists, uh, which is weird because you know, I listened to Coco Taylor when I was a kid. I saw Coco Taylor, I've been, I snuck into Coco Taylor's when I was underage, but looked like I was 30, but was only 16, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now is to try and find we're at 37 percent this year, um, but I want to get to 50 percent um, as we drive forward. So uh, that's, yeah, uh, Emma Johnson, Birmingham Banks, you know, the, the reaction that we get from that, um, I think is hugely, hugely important. Do you, do you find that female artists attract female audiences? So reassured by the fact uh, that, that the person on stage is one of them and they hope they feel it's okay to like this? Yeah, I mean, I guess you would say, uh, that in this country, blues would be a more male, more popular with male than female, yes. traditionally. And, you know, if you if you look at the clientele of the Upton Blues Festival, you might say that. But actually, there is a... I find the female fans to be, uh, in some cases, far more knowledgeable and far more invested in... Um, in what we're doing and yeah I mean it does we you know it creates a safe space um, and it creates uh, some beautiful moments if you think about somebody like Connie Lush um, I've never experienced anything than the on like the encore that Connie Lush did a couple of years ago for us you know just guitar and the female voice 
Now you could say that's not necessarily the blues, but it sure as hell is rooted in the blues, um, and uh, it creates emotion. It creates emotion, um, and uh, you know it, when you contrast that with some of the other, where you hear the same songs every single time. Um, there is so much to learn about the blues and so much to listen to uh, with the blues and, and, and blues-based music. The, the, what I love about it is you'll never know it. You'll never master it. You'll never, ever say, yeah, oh yeah, I've heard. Because you'll always have a conversation like we're having now, and somebody will say, have you heard? And you'll go, mm, no. Oh, you need to. Uh, and unlike some pop and Indian rock stuff, you actually do need to. When somebody says, you need to hear this, you need to hear it. Um, and that's, that's uh, hugely exciting as a booker, as a musician, and, and, and as a fan as well. Well, it was about time you formed another blues band, Steve. Yeah, I know, we're, we're talking about it. We're talking about it. <laughs> keep, keep me informed. I will do. Steve Sandhouse, I found that unusual, interesting, Quite different from our previous blues talkings. I yeah, really enjoyed it. I'm sure you did too. Steve Stonehouse. <laughs>